There is no great revelation, no great secret. There is only you. It was and, and remains very controversial. controversial. This podcast is not suitable for children or those who are easily disturbed. Spoiler warning for whatever is in the title of this episode. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share and subscribe. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that the Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Welcome to episode 78 of The Horror of Babylon, where we are discussing Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. I'm Ryan, and with me as always is Daniel. Say hi, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. And Hef is here, too. How y'all doing? Good to be here. Is it really good to be here? For this? <laughs> I like the boys. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I'm here for the company. I love the boys. <laughs> I'm here for the company. Ladies and gentlemen of the podcast, I have but followed nature. <laughs> Come on. This is this book's great. B U T T have followed nature. Thank you to our patrons, Abigail the First, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons. And thank you to Logan, the, the Full, Full Metal, Metal Patron. Patron. And thank you to Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming, which you can visit at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia, or the Mall at Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and say hello to the proprietor, Ronald the Third, Grampus of Christmas. Came prepared with a lewd comment about per usual. However, I don't feel I should say this one because he already has two blue dots on his house, and as you you know the third blue dot is strike your out trigger warning <laughs> if necessary <laughs> <laughs> if there if this book is the reason why trigger warnings exist <laughs> um which it is not true but should be okay so if you are triggered by sexual abuse pedophilia gaslighting or murder then you may be wary of this novel the film adaptations and our discussion of this novel and now, without further ado, our history with Lolita. We'll be kicking it off with Daniel. He can tell us about this book and why we're covering it. I was somewhere between 10 and 12 years old, right? Stop. <laughs> Stop. Just hold on. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> it's it's super late at night, and uh, there's a movie on TV. In this movie, uh, this old British dude's talking to this woman who's screaming at him about something that she found in a journal, and then she runs out into traffic and dies. He then goes and picks up a girl and starts fucking her. And I'm like, huh, this movie's kind of weird. I'm not sure I should be watching this. And then I proceed to watch the rest of the movie. Fast forward to I'm in college and I'm like, you know what? I kind of want to I want to read some books. Like I'm getting into like some, some literature. And uh, I can't remember who recommended the leader or how it came up. And I'm like, weren't me. I go, huh, a book about a dude who wants to fuck a little girl. That sounds fucked up. Let's read that. And I read it, and I'm like, oh, it's that movie I watched before I hit puberty. Fucked up indeed. <laughs> For years, as long as I've known you, anytime anybody says, I need a book to read, you say, oh, you should read Lolita. That's great. <laughs> and... <laughs> For years, I thought you were trolling, and now I know you're only half trolling. <laughs> um, so, I had to, I read this two years ago in 2021, where I had a job where I could listen to audiobooks the entire eight hours I was working, and I would I ran out of books on Audible very quickly. So I was going through what was free on Audible, and Lolita was free that month, and. I wouldn't say that I, I wanted to read it, but I've, Daniel had recommended it so many times and it was such an important book to him and it was free and I literally was, ran out of audiobooks to listen to. So I was like, you know what? Fine. Fine. <laughs> so I listened to it and uh, we'll get more into my initial impressions, but I, this is what I'll say to 
characterize my first experience with Lolita. I literally had to drink Pepto Bismol <laughs> while listening to this book because I was. People people say all the time, "Oh, that movie made me sick." This book made me physically nauseous. I had to drink Pepto Bismol. Uh, my history is I was told to read this book because we were doing it for the podcast. I ordered it on eBay. It took an extra two weeks to get here. So I only had two and a half weeks to read the book. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. So I literally finished this book two days ago. I am very fresh off this book. I'm not going to say I speed read it, but I speed read it. <laughs> and uh, we're here, and I'm two days out, and I'm ready to talk about this. I feel like I need a few more therapy sessions before I'm ready to talk about it, but I'm glad at least two of us are. Yeah. <laughs> the vampires are pure myth, superstition. I may be able to bring you proof that the superstition of yesterday can become the scientific reality of today. Jumping into background, this book was, of course, written by Vladimir Nabokov, the famously known as an American Russian novelist. He was born in Russia in 1899 and died 1977. So he was born in the the waning days of Imperial Russia, the last days of the Romanov dynasty. He his family was actually expelled from Russia during the uh, communist revolution. They uh, spent some time in Germany. They spent some time in the UK. Eventually, he moved to the United States and became a United States citizen. The most famous thing about him is he learned English and he was already a novelist. He he published, I think, like nine books when he was living in Germany. But then he switched from writing in Russian to writing in English and began publishing in English in the United States. And Lolita was one of the novels he published in English. However, it was originally published in France, in Paris, in the year 1955 by Olympia Press. And this globe-hopping madman ended his life by retiring in Switzerland. So, he'd just been all over the place. Seems like he lived quite the life. He did. He did. <laughs> I did just, like, the briefest amount of research on this guy's life. So, of course, you know... I'm now. I am now an expert on all things Vladimir. Not no we read his Wikipedia. <laughs> I, I read half of it, <laughs> so now I know everything. But the impression I got that his the family he came from was like like the poster child of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> like it was a privileged, rich Russian family who could uh, chart their ancestors all the way back to a Tartar prince who who began serving the Romanovs and then up to the present with Vladimir Nabokov. His grandfather was the minister of justice under Tsar Alexander II and his father was a famous Russian nonfiction writer. This guy had a very privileged life but a very a very cultured and multicultural life as he lived in he lived in Russia, he lived in the Crimea, Germany, UK, America like this guy he knew stuff. But definitely struck me as somebody that Lenin and uh, and Marx and all of uh, all of their ilk would not have not have gotten along with. Yeah, <laughs> Lolita itself, as we said, was pu first published in Paris in 1955. Before you start, I'm still like I read the words. This novel was first published, and I just keep going back to myself, being like, "How the fuck did this get published?" Well, it was published in France. <laughs> And what, they're looser there? Um, yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Until they're not. Until they're not. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. The, I'm, glad, I'm glad this is on point, though. <laughs> Nobukov said that the, and I, I love this expression, the initial sh uh, shiver of inspiration for Lolita. Shiver is a good word. <laughs> that is a good word. <laughs> uh, was somehow prompted by a newspaper story about an ape in the Jardin des Plantes. Yeah, I could not read that. After months of coaxing by a scientist, this ape produced a drawing ever charcoal by the, an animal. The first ever charcoal oh. drawing done by an animal. Yeah. The sketch and showed the bars of the poor animal's cage. How did this inspire Lolita? I'm going to sound a little bit like Bill Dimbro's English professor here. 
But I suppose <laughs> you could say that Humbert Humbert is a prisoner to his own <laughs> desires. <laughs> yeah. I don't really know how you... I guess you, he was also in jail, and he's called a brute and a beast a lot. Yeah. <laughs> he is also technically a primate. Primate. Primate, so... But I saw, I, I saw that quote, and I'm like, how can we not talk about how a monkey inspired I have, this? I have a more level one reading. The ape, the ape was hunched over, drawing a picture, much like a child would, and he just thought, maybe some people are attracted to children. <laughs> I, I believe it is true that there are some people who are attracted to children. Yeah, I babysit a lot of them for a living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lolita is frequently described as an erotic novel, mm -hmm. not only by critics, but it's by some people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then... So after the initial print was 5,000 copies and it, and it completely sold out, uh, there weren't a lot of reviews of the book initially. Nope. Uh, at the very end of 1955, Graham Greene from the London Sunday Times called it one of the three best books of 1955. I'm curious what the other two best books were. Not that I've read a ton of novels from the, 1955, but... It was like Roy O'Bannon. It was second to the Bible that year. <laughs> Royal Bannon versus, versus the, the mommy. mommy. <laughs> <laughs> that movie's so dumb, but I love it I so know. much. I know. Graham Greene's editor, John Gordon, called it the filthiest book I've ever read in sheer, unrestrained pornography. Uh, British custom officers were then instructed by the Home Office to seize all copies entering the UK, and in 1956, France followed suit, and the Minister of the Interior banned Lolita, and it was banned, and See, the ban lasted for two it. years. <laughs> After they printed it. For two years, they banned it. Uh, Eventually, the British uh, republishing of the book in 1959 was controversial enough that it contributed to the end of the political career of a conservative member of parliament by the name of Nigel Nicholson, uh, who was a partner of the publication company. So apparently he worked for the publication company that published Lolita and he lost his political career because of it. Yeah, they just, I mean, like, think about what they use for attack ads now. Yeah, yeah you're right. That's <laughs> that's pretty shitty, but yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not that much different than what we see today. Yeah. yeah. It was and, and remains, remains very controversial. controversial. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that. Another story in the classic, infallible three-act structure. Good enough for Aristotle, good enough for The Simpsons. Mr. Sislak, I have a feeling there's going to be one more act to this story. Well, I'm not hanging around for that. Four acts. Structure and themes. Daniel, tell us about the structure of Lolita. All right. Uh, the book is told... Uh, it's all first person, told from Humbert Humbert's perspective as a confession he is writing from his jail cell. Which is also a, a rewriting of a journal... That was destroyed. <laughs> that was destroyed. <laughs> but my photographic memory allows me to perfectly recreate this. Sure. What about photographic as much as, like, I believe herb if, herbalist? I believe if Humbert Humbert had a true photographic memory, he probably would have came himself to death many nights ago. <laughs> I just imagine, like, prison guards, be because of the... The book isn't, like, obscenely long, but as, like, a confession letter... He, him going to prison going, I was going, hey, I need some more paper. And they're like, what else did you do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys ever got in like, trouble in school and then they like make you write down what happened. That happened to me twice and I I once had to ask for more paper and the guy's like, what'd you do? <laughs> uh, and he's just like, you know, a bunch of this isn't necessary information. I'm like, to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm embellishing. <laughs> I'm letting you know the context. Yeah. It's not just like a Bart Simpson thing where you're just like yeah, writing no. the same thing a thousand times on the wall. That's This book would be much more uneventful if that's just what he did. I touched uh, a kid. I touched a kid. I touched there, a kid. There's I this one episode kid. of The Simpsons where Bart goes like this. And if you can't, you can't see because this is a podcast, but I'm rotating <laughs> my wrists in circles. And it, they the sound effect they use is a cement mixer. <laughs> Super gross. Um, it's mostly linear with a couple exceptions where he kind of deviates and goes on like these little tirades 
and went, oh, I forgot about this incident on March 3rd, 1926, or some some stupid shit like that. Themes. Oh, God, there's a lot. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole quote. I but, will. Okay, you want to go ahead. <laughs> it's a long quote. You there are gentle <laughs> souls who would pronounce Lolita meaningless because it does not teach them anything. I am neither a reader nor a writer of didactic fiction. And despite John Ray's assertion, Lolita has no moral in tow. Duh. For me, a work of fiction exists only in so far as it affords me what I shall bluntly call aesthetic bliss. That is a sense of being somehow somewhere connected with other states of being where art curiosity, tenderness, kindness, ecstasy is the norm. There are not many such books. All the rest is either topical trash or what some call literature of ideas, which very often is topical trash coming in huge blocks of plaster that are carefully transmitted from age to age until somebody comes along with a hammer and takes a good crack at Balzac, at Gorky, at Man. Wow, he... Is, is is Vladimir Nabokov just Humbert Humbert? Because I would I would believe that Humbert Humbert said that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, well, uh, as a common man, let me tell you what I took from that. He's a. I, dick. I put I put so many artsy, fantastical soliloquies and sentences in my story mm -hmm. that it confused ninety percent of the people that read it, with the exception of when I said, "Then there's eleven year old involved." <laughs> One of the the things about this book is it has no moral message no intentional moral message he just wanted to write pretty words about a fucked up story he certainly did yeah or at least that's what he says yeah there's no moral in tow i love it maybe <laughs> maybe what's more important the intent of the author who wrote the book or the reception of the millions of readers who read the book Depends on how much you like it. Okay. <laughs> I don't think that's right. <laughs> I don't think that's correct. <laughs> then some other themes, aesthetic bliss, because he flat out goes, yeah, I want to write and use all this super pretty language to describe all of these things, these purple prose. It's very much about getting you to feel in the moment of Humbert Humbert. Ugh. Again, Pepto-Bismol. Uh, perversion. I don't, th don't think we can deny that. Um, Roll back it's to the aesthetic, perverse. Roll back to the aesthetic bliss, real quick. Like I feel like this has like reading this book. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that most of the time I was reading it, I did feel like I was kind of tossed back into Frankenstein. Yeah, because the language is very delicate. The language is very pretty, mm -hmm. and it is kind of using extreme verbiage and various little homonyms and whatnot to actually describe a very bitterly dour story and kind of a, you know, puts it on a little bit higher of a tone with the rest of the actual like language that it's trying to display. So Pretty I, language, I, dark story. It's it's romantic in the sense. It's like a it, romantic yeah, period. A romantic period piece is what it seemed like, even yeah. though it's technically at the time... is like, not a love story. Right, yeah. <laughs> So unless you're Vanity Fair, so so like but I, reading this book, like it, it does kind of put you in a, in a state of mind where it's like you're either reading like a classic romantic novel. Vanity Fair said this was uh, what the only great love story of the 20th century. It was some stupid quote like in that. terms of the written language, maybe, but I wouldn't say in terms. Of, they okay, obviously we, we, didn't I'm, read Shogun. <laughs> <laughs> Or Taipan. <laughs> the Taipan, goddammit! We got abuse and betrayal. Can we deny abuse as a theme in this book? No. Descent into self-delusion and madness. Yes. See, no, I disagree there, because I'm pretty sure he was self-deluded from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. I honestly mm -hmm. feel like the more it goes on, you start to catch him more in his, like, little fibs, or where he's, like, projecting his own thoughts onto Lolita, or onto other characters as opposed to like actually letting them speak dialogue uh, there's one line towards the end where he's like and I looked at her and I knew what she would say was that he only broke my heart you broke me completely or something like that but she doesn't actually say that that's Humbert projecting thoughts onto her in their last meeting hmm. I think one of the better lines in the book that like kind of emphasizes Humbert as a person is 
I am capable of lying with Eve, but I seek Lilith. <laughs> yeah. I think that one kind of, like, stands out to me as, like, he's aware, like, in terms of a societal idea that what he's doing is, n and what he feels is not okay. It's and he, not good. And at the same time, he still tries to but justify he, it. But, yeah, it's, like, this constant str struggle with himself where, like, as, as far as a societal norm, like, he does struggle with, I know this is... But, 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 see, that's the thing. He says it, it's deemed wrong. Yeah. It's seen wrong. At no point in the book does it any make, make it any point to me that he regrets anything. No, not at all, because he got yeah. what he wanted. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's no regret in his actions, even though he knows that consciously, he, as far as from he goes on like this whole giant tirade trying to explain the science of nymphets. Now, not all little girls are nymphets, you see. Yeah, but all nymphets are not little Eskimos. Girls. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there are no nymphet Eskimos. <laughs> there are no nymphet Eskimos. Yeah, I forgot. You're so racist I bastard. <laughs> So, like, this this book kind of also tosses us into the idea of, like, being a reliable narrator. Mm -hmm. So, like, the question I had the whole time I was reading it was, like, if this guy is embellishing his experiences to the degree he is doing, how little happened mm -hmm. or how much happened? And that's, like, the constant, like, tug of war I was dealing with when I was reading this book is, like, we don't really know. Yeah. We just, we know what he tells us. I don't want to know. That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, it's, it is... I don't know. If you read it from like the unreliable narrator perspective, it actually I think makes the book a little more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, erotic language as a theme. I, I thought it wasn't an erotic book. <laughs> <laughs> I I think the word erotic is what we would determine as to like what did what deems erotic. He uses erotic language to describe a thing that we should not be finding erotic. It certainly. He he finds Lolita erotic, mm. and he uses erotic language yeah, to it, describe her. The, mm. the book is like uh, just filled to the brim with eroticism, mm. but you shouldn't get turned on by it. Mm. Just because that doesn't necessarily... It's filled with eroticism. That doesn't mean that the author in, intended to be intended it to be pornographic. Mm. Mm. You can definitely read this and perceive it as pornography. However, mm, I think a lot of my patients would. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe that was the intent, and it certainly was not how I received it. <sighs> I uh, so the two points I would like bring up are like the first the first part of the book where he's describing his affair with like the other girl that's like close to his age, Annabelle. Annabelle or. I yeah, Annabelle. I don't, I don't Annabelle's know. right. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that particular relationship physically is described in great detail. Like it's that one scene I think in the garden. Yeah. Like that, that is described in great detail in terms of a physicality. And if Some they wouldn't <clears throat> and if they wouldn't have come then, out of the ocean, I would have had her. Yeah, and then later oh. whenever it's like involving anything with like Lolita, Dolores herself. Mm -hmm. Dolores. That's left out. Yeah. There's nothing real physically intimate in those particular chapters. There is one particular one, but that was self gratification mm -hmm. rather than an outright exploitation. Where he's wrestling with her. Is that right. what you're talking about? Yeah. yeah like okay. that's so it's. I don't know if it's important, but I feel like it's something that he did on purpose. Where like is like as I don't that's know. the wonderful thing. Nothing's important. Oh yeah, and it, everything's uh, important. Nothing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, like it's all equally unimportant. F. Mm. Can we read Lord of the Rings? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it has elves. <laughs> you, you did this. And we get, we can do Lord of the Rings in, in Gimli. In Gimli. Gimli. Gimli, so much. <laughs> don't tell the elf. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like Tolkien and uh, Nobokov having a conversation would be hilarious. Actually, I think they actually have a lot in common because they're both very about it's it's about a ring. Yeah, it's about a store. It's about a pervert. Like <laughs> no, no one questions a, no one questions no, a it, dwarf it, woman with a beard. We will question, however, the eleven year old getting the sideways. No, no, it's not a it's not an analogy for World War Two. No, there's not some deep moral lesson. It's just about a dude who's fucked up, and it's about a sick man. Yeah, it's about a sick man giving you his perspective on a fucked up situation. I wish I was as a uh, eloquent as Humbert Humbert. If I could be as well spoken without without the perversions, without the perversions, sure. yeah, sure. 
Yeah, like, I wish I could talk like that and just, like, spin tales like he does. Yeah, I Because he... I, I, there are points in this book where I get lost in his words. He speaks a good word. Yeah. Like, he's talking about, like, all these... Mo- we'll get to that once Hef's back and we get into characters. Yeah, Hef bailed. He's like, I'm done. I'm he's out. Like, They're coming to get you, Barbara. Characters. Humbert Humbert. Who I, I would argue is really the only real character in this book, but there are certainly other people. There are people that he talks about. Okay, so you tell us about Humber Humbert. I'll read my notes first, and then I will go into tirades. He is a bad man. <laughs> he is a unreliable narrator. Maybe. He is a literature professor. <laughs> He's Bill's professor! Yeah, he, that, that's his origin. <laughs> God, did the dates line up for that? No. A narcissist. I think that's kind of hard to deny. The, the narcissist. The, that painting is so trite. <laughs> I think that's the example you sent me. Yeah, he, uh, when he goes to uh, Fat Hayes' house yeah. for the first time, he's like, oh, it's the same Monet painting that every middle class home in America has hanging in the boudoir. <laughs> God damn it. I love how he talks about that woman. <laughs> And I was just about to finish when and all of a sudden Fat Hayes ruined it. Damn you, Fat Hayes! He's uh, very well-spoken and educated regardless of what can be believed. He's he's proof just because you're educated doesn't mean you're better. Which <laughs> unfortunately destroys my party's position. He, uh, he literally just kind of goes into, like, French. And will just start speaking it out of nowhere. There is a decent amount of this book is in French, which... I don't know what they said. Yeah. <laughs> Super big boobs. And, and ne- Nabokov's just okay with that. He's just like, well, if you don't know French, you don't get to know what this part of the book says. Yeah. Great. And I, yeah. I love how he, Appreciate oh God, it. he starts criticizing uh, Fat Hayes' French. <laughs> Fat Hayes. <laughs> I, who probably wasn't even fat. She was just a woman his age. <laughs> yeah, she was probably just like the typical like mom bod that we're all attracted to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because we're like, not sick. I like how he goes out of his way to describe himself as being like what all men should look like. He's, <laughs> he's like what all I could have any woman at the drop of a hat. I believe he says they all love me. My the hair on my knuckles and my British accent. He even says in the beginning of the book that he specifically doesn't talk to a lot of women in order to not have them fall in love with him. What a doink. <laughs> And by the way, uh, Humbert Humbert replaced James Potter as my least favorite character in all of literature. Okay, uh, I was going to ask this towards the end. Is Humbert Humbert the worst protagonist that we've had on the show? In terms of, like, moral character, yes. Worse than Gunter. <laughs> I... I... I guess Humbert feeds Lolita. Yeah. Gunter he also doesn't... feeds on Lolita, though. Because yeah. if you think about it, like, we, we don't actually know the age of that girl. And, and the Confederado, they say she she's... could be between 16 and 19. But, but Gunter literally, like, keeps her on a rope, ties her up outside the house, doesn't feed her, beats her. Mm-hmm. So, no, I, I guess Humbert is better than Gunter. Ugh. Humbert Humbert, you get the silver medal. Oh, that, that yeah, was I hard. Even, I don't even feel like silver medal. It's really <laughs> something you can, like... <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've been waiting to do that all week. I don't like it. <laughs> what are your guys' thoughts on Humbert Humbert? He speaks good. He does speak well. <laughs> <laughs> he, in, in all of the books I've read... He's up there. He's probably in the top five protagonists that I understand best because there are very few characters and books that you really get as deep in in his head as you do with Humbert Humbert. And he just lets you know. (laughs) Yeah. So do I enjoy being in Humbert Humbert's head? No. Not at all. But... Hef, talk. I don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> Hef, so, how do you feel about Humbert Humbert? This Humbert Humbert is a good example of realizing your realizing your own 
like ineptitudes. <laughs> <clears throat> there were a lot of times in this book where you are reading things to such a deep degree from Humbert's perspective that to a degree there are points you sympathize with him. I think that's not one of empathize, the book's not empathize, sympathize. I, I think that's one of the book's strengths. Yes, there are because for, empathetically mm. or sympathetically, more like I get that right. There's, yeah, <laughs> emp- sympathetically, there is there are points of this where Humbert is very much aware that what he's doing is not okay, it, and he parts tr- of that starts to shine and, through, and he tries at several times throughout the book to circumvent it. Mm -hmm. Like, he's not outwardly trying to be this kind of entity that he's basically avoiding. He just kind of, like, falls into the perfect situation, and the rest of it just kind of unfolds to the point where he becomes an even more diminished and just unlikable entity as Mm -hmm. the book goes. So, like, because at the the beginning of the book, I kind of, like, again, I can kind of sympathize with a portion of it, because in the first part of the book, He's trying to stave it off. He's trying to just as he fucks child prostitutes. <laughs> but in like, there's just there's several points where he's trying to push away from it, and then yeah. Lolita basically just like puts him in the perfect position to do anything he wants. I uh, I didn't include it in the notes, but what did you guys think about his uh, first marriage? He's a jerk, and she could do better. <laughs> he, he he literally talks about how. I could control her just by pinching her thigh or maybe giving her a small tap against the buttocks. Yeah. And he, he says something like, it's not therapeutic, I forget the word, but like, maybe the, the therapeutic ritual of marriage would help me get past these desires that mm. I have. Yeah, if I just have someone to like fucking go through the routines with, maybe I, I'll, I'll be able to ignore it. Yeah. To be fair, apparently it works for a time because he just gets in a couple kind of years. Of, he gets in kind of a rut with this woman Alleged, allegedly because mm-hmm. we don't know how much <clears throat> of this is true but he, he he says that he rarely has sex with her and then she leaves him and he gets so indignant over this woman that he doesn't even really want because it's it's very narcissistic it's someone's, just an insult to him mm-hmm. someone's taking what belongs to him yeah he very much objectifies her but he's at the end of the day he is such a soft man and he's such a in that situation where he can't even confront the dude who came in. And it's like, oh yeah, I've been fucking your wife and I'm running off with her. But he peed in his toilet and didn't flush. <laughs> oh wait, maybe that's just a cultural thing. Maybe he was trying to save her. And water. then he, he, like, he, ju- he justifies it in his head right there. I think that that's a great sequence in the book to get you into like who this dude is. Because what he'll do is he'll notice like some grave insult or he'll notice something and then he goes into justification like right away. I did read things about this saying that like he is a complicated person. And to a degree, that's fairly true, but honestly, I I don't think he's very complicated. I think he's a narcissistic person who doesn't get his way for a very long time. And then he finds So he tries to settle. Yeah. And then once he finally does get his way, it just basically just stands. And then he doesn't want to give it up no matter what. Right. So then he just deteriorates into an even further piece of shit than what he was before. That's that's Humbert's whole character is I couldn't do this before, but now I can. And that's his whole character. All right. To me. Next up we have Annabelle Lay. Uh Humbert Humbert's first love. Is it Lee or Lay? Lay? I don't know. I, think, I can't I remember Lee. how it was pronounced. It yeah. might be Lee. I say Lee. We'll say Lee then. Sure. Annabelle Lee. And uh she died of typhoid. <laughs> uh we, we, we I laugh because it's slap or cry. <laughs> Uh, Ryan and I have talked about this a few times about how uh, I think our biggest example was always furries like what happens oh they around the time they are hitting puberty something happens and wires get crossed and we were talking about that messenger he's like man I wonder what uh, crossed Humbert Humbert's wires and I go Ryan he tells you he tells you exactly how that happened I uh, <laughs> I blacked out most of this book yeah do elaborate Daniel a little girl let him rummage around in her underwear. Mm. He has this first love, right? Mm. And he never gets to fulfill this desire with her that he had around the time he's hitting puberty. So he's perpetually stuck in this age range in his head over what sex and fantasies about sex are. The reason I'm bringing this up is I found this book to be oddly insightful on how these sort of connections happen to a person. 
where he basically just goes, yeah, here's an entire sequence of how this can actually happen. And he writes it down, and this book was published in 1955. Well, I mean, he was growing up in the era where, like, Freud's, like, books That's were... really starting to take off. Yeah. But it's just, you don't get to see that a lot actually explained in a novel, or actually yeah. discussed in a novel. <laughs> you just, this person has this perverted kink, and you're not expected <clears throat> to think about it. Yeah. Where Humpert Humpert's like, let me tell you my origin story on my perverted quest for nymphets. I think that's what makes this book a little bit disturbing. A little bit, a lot of it. <laughs> a lot of it disturbing. Yeah, it is, it's, it's a book that opens up the avenue that like there is no secrets in something that is very secretive of the mind. Yeah. That's what that's what really weirds me out about it. Is like there's points of this book where you're reading this and being just like this is too real. I think it's oddly insightful in the uh most disturbing way. In a way, yeah, I would um, say that. And I'll have more to say on that once we get to Dolores Hayes. Sure. My opinion of Annabelle Fat is Hayes. Yeah. This, Next up is, this is Fat Hayes. This is this is one like Annabelle is one I can't quite grasp my head around like yeah, she, it, she, i think that's also because i'm not a broken human being i i, I understand the concept yeah. but like i can't for the life of me grasp the idea of being so infatuated physically and mentally by somebody who was just a child i just always think of it as like welcome to the very last episode of the war <laughs> <laughs> you you this, Every, was, this was the end game. Lots of people have weird fetishes. You have people who, like, get erections from <coughs> sitting on balloons. Well, how does that happen? It's these weird little synapse firings. I find that kind of, this shit fascinating. I studied psychology because I wanted to study human sexuality. Mm. I like new room massages. For Daniel, it was watching Bram Stoker's Dracula way yeah. too long in a, young in age. That, that's what fucked me up. And apparently this, because I also saw this movie around the comic book guy, it was the female gremlin from gremlins 2 yeah <laughs> also it just could be like it's one of those like old old man like things yeah where like i'm just i'm kind of set as who i am and as an individual oh yeah because and it's really like I, i'm trying not to be this way you, your synopsis have <clears throat> already formed but then that's it like it's just in this point in my life like it's so hard for me to comprehend other people i try not to judge them uh -huh. I sh you should never judge someone i don't think i think we could judge Humphrey <clears throat> a little bit you should you should judge him <laughs> But for the most part, you don't. You're, you try not to judge people because everybody has something. You know, it's it's fine. Whatever. <laughs> I, I understood the purpose of Annabelle Lee, but not the after effect of Annabelle Lee. But again, I'm not a broken individual. So yeah. No next. claws. Next. We're terrible people. Charlotte. She got the, hit by a car. The fat haze. <laughs> fat haze. Mother with bad taste in men. <laughs> Apparently not, because he's apparently what every woman he's wants. He's every woman wants, that's right. I honestly think that she had just been alone for so long that when a mildly attractive guy came by and was like willing to tolerate a woman with a kid, she's like, oh, okay, he's dad material. Well, I mean, if you think about it, like, I mean, granted, this was the 50s, it wasn't that long ago, but... It was... But a widowed woman, and, you know, historically, back in the day, like, would, would be with a man who was willing to care for her and their children, so... Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I think she makes. I think she makes the most sense of anybody in this book. Put down here, she's a good example of gaslighting by Humbert. Like he's the big scene is like when she goes, "Oh, we're gonna go to uh, Europe next year," and he's like, "Oh, I hate Europe," and he uses it to try to like weasel in his own ideas in her head. You're from Europe, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and uh, whenever she first finds his diary. And he comes downstairs and he's like, they're characters from a novel. I used your names out of convenience. Like, he's ready. He's already going into his tirades. He's ready to gaslight this woman. And honestly, I think if she would have heard him, she might have actually gone, okay. But by that point, she was already running. Allegedly. We'll get to that. The fact that she got hit by a car. He threw her in front of a car. Like, that, that was like... That whole sequence just, like, hurt my head when I was or, reading it. Or whenever uh, they're in the lake and he's going, they're, those people over there are just far enough away to where it would look like I'm saving her. Oh, God. Um, one of my favorite lines up from this book, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, is, man cannot create the perfect murder, but coincidence can. <laughs> I, I, I love that line. Unfortunately, was it a coincidence, or, as Dolores suggests over and over again, did he murder her? I would not be shocked to find a secret letter from Vladimir Nobokov that said, 
Yeah, he totally killed her. <laughs> I think he yeah, intentionally with, with no a flowery language at all. It's just yeah, he fucking killed her. He off that bitch. <laughs> because Dolores isn't the only one to bring it up. There, uh, Quilty is suspicious of it, even though he doesn't recognize who Humpert is in the moment. No, I you just saved her from that that guy who killed our mother. The movie I saw, which was the one with Jeremy Irons, which by the way, if you listen to this on Audible, <laughs> he reads the audiobook. <laughs> and he's so good. He's real good. <laughs> He's too good, probably. Yeah. Um, I agree. <laughs> in that movie, she does just run out into traffic. But whenever you're talk- making a movie about an unreliable narrator, sometimes it's hard to convey certain things that are meant to be ambiguous. Yeah, and of course, like, it's all up for debate. Yeah. Nothing is nothing is real. But nothing I mean, is re- nothing the, matters. Well, the whole book, None of this matters. The, the whole book is just one big debatable topic. So, I mean, what's who's to say that the subject isn't either? I mean, who's to say he's even an unreliable narrator? For all we know, it's completely true. You don't know. Vladimir's dead. <laughs> yeah, he's not going to tell us. And even, up. Even if he says... Even if the author says he is an unreliable narrator, if I perceive it as truth... <laughs> Like, what are you going to do to stop me? Yeah, also, exactly. what, what if the author is the unreliable narrator? Hmm. I probably. Hmm. De- Dolores Hayes, Dolly, Lolita, oh my Lolita, 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 Lolita. I fucking Have love Have you watched The Professional you... yet? <laughs> no. You need to watch that fucking movie. Leon I'm, the Professional. Leon the Professional. I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to enjoy it too much. <laughs> yeah, Leon the Professional. Dumb. What do you guys think of Dolores Hayes? Dumb kid. Actually, I agree. Uh, but there's these sections in this book where uh, Humbert Humbert's going, man, she is so immature. Her mother was right about a few things. She's acting so childish. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. duh. Because, you know, she's a kid. Uh, I, I think that uh, the book really does a good job of getting across that she is, she's not like, like what a pedophile would say, like mm-hmm. quote unquote mature for her age. Mm-hmm. She is literally a 13, 14 year old girl. Mm-hmm. She she likes to read her movie magazines and, and she's tolerating this because as Humbert Humbert says mm-hmm. she has nowhere else to go. Mm-hmm. You cannot pass! I am the servant of the secret fire wielder of the flame of Anor. The dark fire will not avail you. Flame of my loins! Go back! To the shadow. I love it. <laughs> I, I think we're done talking about Dolores. Let's move on. No, no, we got. We, we, do, do, Ryan, what do you think of what do you think of Lolita as a character? He just read it. <laughs> that that you fool. Uh, victim. Victim. Yeah. Uh, she lives a very short, sat and vi- sat, sad, sad and violent life. I think it's it's very hard for me to even comment on her because. I do think she does some stupid things, but she's also a child. She's literally a child. Yeah. So, and the stupid things that she does reminds me of stupid shit that a young <laughs> teenager might do. Yeah. So, uh, like making a joke, because in my head, when she makes quote unquote a pass at Humbert, it's mm-hmm. a joke. Mm-hmm. It's her, a gir- young girl discovering her sexuality teasing her new stepfather. Yeah, like, I'm I'm going to go to daddy's party and flirt with his work friends. Like, yeah, that kind of stupid shit. Yeah. Where in Humbert Humbert's head, it's, oh, she wasn't even a virgin. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Which he literally says, like, I wasn't even her first. And then he tells a story about how she supposedly lost her virginity, but I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure I believe you, buddy. That's the whole thing. Like, just, like Even, that's, if, that's even if it's true, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. Yeah. And then the very next day, she actually, and because this is where like little things start to like seep through, where like the cracks where it makes you think he's unreliable, unreliable, where she flat out goes, "You're a brute. You raped me," <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." Even if you consented, it would still <laughs> <Nope>. be rape. <laughs> Even she cannot consent. Yeah. she can say yes. Yeah, but that's not consent because yeah, she's not an adult. People can't see my quotation marks. Yeah, I keep yeah, forgetting that I do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that seeps through in this book. And there, there, that's the kind of shit I love in this book is, like, you get all of these beautiful, fucked-up prose, and then you get these, like, little bits, and then Humbert immediately tries to cover them up to distract you in the next line. Working with the same data, and we are just coming to different conclusions. <laughs> Claire Quilty. 
I don't remember who that is. I also don't remember who that is. It's the man who, uh, quote unquote, Oh, that's the one he shot. Is that the one he shot? Yeah. Oh, okay. He's the one who rescues her. And allegedly, he uses her in pornographic films, tries to get her to do orgies, and she doesn't Uh, want to do it, so she leaves. I'm going to offer some criticism of this book that isn't related to pedophilia. Okay. I think the second half of the book is kind of boring. Where it's just from hotel to hotel to hotel to hotel. I'm like, okay, I get it. I get too lost in the language, so... My I, problem was in the last half of it, I was just generally lost in just I, actual stagnation. Yeah, like, I was like, nothing happens. I don't. Yeah, nothing Nothing you're, happens. You're li- it's literally just, I'm going to go to one <laughs> hotel to the next, and there's just sad, pathetic scene. Like, it's, 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 it's always sad when a man begs a woman for sex. But when a 30-whatever-year-old begs a teenager for sex, it's literally the saddest and most pathetic <laughs> I think, thing in I the think he's world. in his 40s by the end of the novel. Okay, well... Obviously, I'm not a huge fan of this book. I think it would be a more effective story, cut out like most of the last 200 pages, and just ha- after the initial uh, the the initial just, just, act after the first rape after you, the you first can call rape, it rape just but it maybe is. they run off <laughs> and they get caught shortly after. I I definitely think the worst part of the book is is just that latter half of constantly running. It's not entertaining. Oh, I love it. I just, I just love how like how it gradually builds his obsession to where everything starts seeping through the cracks again, where he like says hello to this little girl and then like this big burly man's like get off my yard and he's like why is he talking to me like this and then he's like oh yeah I forgot I was super muddy and not shaven and <laughs> I don't remember any of this yeah. <laughs> and he he confronts Quilty who's like drunk and high off his ass he starts offering him he's like. Hey, if you put that gun down, I'll give you this house and you can go fuck everybody downstairs and maybe I'll even give you some money. Put that gun down. Put that gun down! Just oh, over and over guy, again. The guy in the mansion? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. He's apparently like a much bigger part in both of the movies. Okay. Uh, uh, he, now I remember. Uh, according to Humbert's version of Dolores, he was an old friend of her mother's who recognized that Humbert was a pedophile just by seeing him. Like He's like game recognized game sort of thing. I had him pegged from the get-go. Oh, you say he raped you. Why don't you come along with me, my dear? And then makes her, or allegedly makes her star in pornographic films and tries to convince her to do orgies, which she won't do. Leon the Professional is the best interpretation of this book. Yeah. By a lot. Yeah. Have you seen uh, what uh, Jeremy Irons looks like in this movie? He wears like this just spectacular bow tie. He's a, he's a sexy man. He looks like a pedophile. We should look. He looks this. like a pedophile. Like he's wearing like this big old bow tie, and he's like so thin. God, where's the one with him in the bow tie? The bow tie. There it is. Just look at him. He looks like a dude who would try to fuck a kid. He looks like Bill Nye. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> Bill Nye, the pedo guy. Bill, Bill, Bill. <laughs> Bill, 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 Bill. Oh, I'm not gonna like this movie. Kill you all! <laughs> I'll drive you crazy and I'll kill you all! I'm every nightmare you ever had! I am your worst dream come true! I'm everything you ever were afraid of! Is this hey, book scary? Hum- Humbert and Quilty should present a very real fear for all parents. And they do. They absolutely do. I've brought this up a few times in this review. I've brought it up throughout the podcast. I work in a mental health hospital. And I literally babysit sex offenders for a living. Not very many of them are like this. Uh, they're not that well-spoken. But, of course, a lot of the ones that I uh, I babysit are people with, like, very severe diagnoses or they're, uh, TB- they have TBIs. Most of them aren't just strictly personality sex offender, except for, like, we've gotten a couple rare ones that... I've gotten a lot of narcissists. I had a narcissist who 100% reminded me of Humbert, mm. but his crime was different. Mm. Being a parent absolutely prevents me from enjoying this book in any way. I agree. I can a- appreciate the book, but I cannot enjoy the book at all. I can appreciate the language in which the book is written. The themes at which it presents make me uncomfortable. Maybe if I wasn't a parent, it would be different. But I, I, I cannot, I cannot fathom a father of a daughter being able to read this book and enjoying it more than it creeps him out. That's why I'm only gonna have sons. 
Okay, Dwight. <laughs> <laughs> the shrew <shirt> bloodline. <laughs> Kiss me, fat boy. Is this an erotic novel? No. <laughs> I do not perceive it as an erotic novel. I don't believe it was intended as an erotic novel. Certainly, there are people out there who probably per perceive, perceive it as erotic. I, I believe aesthetic bliss was a good word. I think I think it's intend. Like I have nothing to base this on except for my two and a half week read. I think that this was intended to be a parody of romantic literature. That might be a good word. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. It's yeah. yeah. It's written in a very delicate flowery language while telling you about what is possibly the most offensive thing that you could read about as an adult human being. Yeah. I say it's a parody. I would believe that. I do not disown that interpretation. Hands in. Go parody. Go parody. <laughs> <laughs> but it is gross. Yes, a hundred percent. Oh my god, are you Stephen King? No, I'm Dean Koontz. Oh. Kings and Koontz, Hef, what is your king? Poor Lolita, and he has to, he has to go to the notebook. To the notes! <laughs> to the notes. <sighs> to the door. The, the best things I could say about this book, obviously, is the you know, romantic language at which it writes itself as. And it is a challenging novel. Like, mm. it's something... If if it's something where you're trying to open your mind up to a new perspective, even if it's not a good perspective, but it's like a different perspective, the book certainly does that. Yeah. My my king is... It, it flabbergasts me that this man was born and raised speaking Russian and can write in English. Mm, better than well. any of us could ever Oh my god, do. yeah, that's that, so dumb. That is my king, and it, it, it just blows my mind. When I first started reading this, I assumed it was written in Russian and translated into English. It blows your humper. <laughs> huh? Every time I read a word, I didn't, like, I had to look up in the source. Like, my first, as I'm reading this book, I'm, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> just put the book down I, and look I up get, the word. I, I normally look, look up words I don't know. I, I did give up partway through this book and just say As soon as he started throwing French at me and I'm just uh, like, you yeah, pretentious I, motherfucker. I didn't, I didn't look up any French words. I mean, <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I think the author's intent there was like, if you are not cultured enough to know French, then you don't deserve I get, to I, know I think that I, 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 I go with the parody aspect of it. He's just like, obviously you're not smart enough to read this book. <laughs> I always just assumed it was Humbert wanting to prove that he's smarter than like everyone else around him still. <laughs> so. You know what? Han Solo speaks three languages, so fuck off, Humbert Humbert. <laughs> My king is when he came home and Fat Hayes had found his journal. Cause that entire sequence is so uncomfortable. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's nearly as funny as you do, but <laughs> Daniel and, Daniel and lives on the cringe. And she's like the 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 fat bitch will no longer be your problem. Yeah. <laughs> and then she quote unquote runs into traffic. My Koontz is everything else about the book that I, I didn't say in the King section. <sighs> to the notes! <laughs> Jesus Christ everything else. <laughs> <laughs> mentioned is our coons. <laughs> I had uh, I had a joke coons, but I don't think I'm gonna say it now. So I'll just go with uh, my real one is it's too short. Uh, it's <laughs> entirely too long. <laughs> it's funny because that, I, was, I was gonna say that my joke was that was Lolita was too old, but <laughs> my uh, it, it's funny continuing the Tolkien comparisons. His Tolkien's only criticism of the Lord of the Rings is that <laughs> it was too short. Yeah. Moving to rankings, I, I ranked mine ahead of time, and I, Daniel, I promise I am not trying to trigger you with this. <laughs> it just doesn't trigger me, dude. I okay. promise. All right. 
this is our lists are based purely on our enjoyment of the books. <laughs> it, if we're if these were the best written, the best the best language, the best construction of a sentence, uh-huh. this book would be very high. Yeah, but w- the first time I w- when I read this, I was the same age that Humbert Humbert was when he met Lolita, and my daughter was the same age that Lolita was and it made me literally physically sick to the point that I had to medicate myself to make it through the book this is my second from the bottom below nothing but black and teeth and above the confederado and it's only only above the confederado because of Gunter (laughs) because of Gunter and spelling mistakes like it's my number one Whoa. <laughs> All right. Oof. Half. God damn. Not even close. So you, you know that blank space. <laughs> Does it go there? That I have. Uh, so so it's, <clears throat> it's, it's not as bad as River of Tea. So <laughs> I guess there's a conversation I, to be had about that's Lolita. That's the thing, <laughs> is we can talk, at least have a conversation about Lolita. River of Teeth just... I don't think I've seen Ryan that drunk on an episode before. I just couldn't give less of a shit that River of Teeth exists. Yeah, no, I, I can sympathize there. There's there's a discussion to be had about this book, but I mean, we were really like scratching the surface for things to even talk about with mm. River of Teeth. And like, we've been going for like what almost two hours now. An hour and eleven minutes. Okay, I need new glasses. I am blind. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even read this list. From here, it feels I was good wondering. To be on we were, top. I was wondering when we were going to call back to that. Yeah, no, it's it's cool. It's, it's cool. It's cool. All right, I, that, new, I enjoyed that episode. No, it was. I, it's I, one of our new running gags. Well, I, I think th- it turned out well. Well, honestly, like like most of the time, we generally agree on things. I like when we don't. I think, yeah, I think that's very fun for banter. No, I I think and I think it's important that we don't agree on everything. Like they're like Lolita, like Lolita. <laughs> yeah, and it's not like okay. So there's there's a class of people who don't like this book and who are basically and I thought about doing this I thought about what if I just go into this episode and just pretend to be this person like this book is is perverted garbage and pornography and anybody who reads it is a pedophile I thought you were going to do that <laughs> I thought about it but I just didn't want to do that to you because and this is I knew if you did that all I was going to do was continuously act more and more like as the episode went, because like, so it'd be like a war of escalation. If it was, if it was a less important book to you than it is, yeah, then, <laughs> then I, I might have done that. But intellectually, I can appreciate this book for what it is. However, I used to try to write like this guy, and I can't. My emotional response to the content of this book way outweighs my intellectual appreciation for the writing like yeah. it's i just and i probably will never be able to get over that and and that's okay but i'm also not anybody who reads lolita is a, is a pedophile pervert <laughs> that's pretty great i think it's i like in a weird kind of sense i think it's one of the more topical books we've read especially with all the stuff that goes on these days yeah like it's like yeah everything's a question anymore and yeah. i think being able to come to your own conclusion about not only just what you're comfortable with, but also like, where's your line? Mm-hmm. I think it's important to know where your line is. I think this book does that. Yeah, yeah. I definitely know where my line is. Mm-hmm. It's Humbert Humbert. <laughs> <laughs> Homework. Your wife finds your secret journal. What revelation causes her to bolt into traffic? I exp- so one of Drake's uh, favorite movies that he watches all the time mm-hmm. is Hotel Transylvania, and the secret that Beck finds out is that when she was not around, I purposely exposed him to this movie so that he would watch it constantly, so that psychologically she would be exposed to Mavis on a regular basis. So eventually, when I get to it and I ask her to role play and cosplay as Mavis for the bedroom, it'll happen. <laughs> 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 
What secret revelation causes your wife to bolt into traffic? The secret is that I actually like women that are fatter than what she thinks I do, <laughs> and uh, which precedes her to start putting on weight. That would also do it. And she gets so big that she can't stand herself. So she throws herself into traffic, not knowing knowing that she can't be skinny enough for me, but she also can't be fat enough for me either. Because I know she's going to listen. Jackie, you're perfect. <laughs> I love everything about your body. Yeah. Jackie, <laughs> yeah, she's great. You're she too is. perfect. She is. She's I, great. My, my ex-wife finds my journal and finds out that our entire divorce was a 4D chess game so I could get to date strippers and she kills herself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question for the listeners. Have you actually read Lolita? Let us know. And I don't even you know, need to necessarily know your opinion on it. Please tell us if you want, but have you read the, has anybody actually read this book? I have not met one yet. Um, no, I, I, I have not. I can't think of anyone outside of this room that I personally know who has read the book, no. Hmm. Obviously, thousands of people across the world have read this book. I just, I don't know them. All right, uh, for further reading, uh, as have said, Leon the Professional is, is the best adaptation. It, it really is. It really is. <laughs> um, Jean Reno, Natalie Portman, you are you guys are just the best. Hmm. Um, I put down Dexter, uh, the novels, not the TV show. You're going to have to explain that. It's all from a serial killer's first person perspective as he's telling you a very unreliable story about how his life is going. It's not nearly as prosy as Lolita, but it tries to be. It also uses a lot more alliteration. Like the first book is Darkly Dreaming Dexter and that's how he talks to himself in his head. He's like, the dastardly deed was done. It's stuff like that. It was a demonically dreary day. The biggest difference between the books and the TV show is in the second book, uh, everything's revealed to be supernatural. And what's his face? Did the audiobook for our last book that we Michael did. Michael C. Hall. That's who. That's my. That's my dream cast for Lewis. Who did the audiobook for Pet Cemetery? It's all a circle. No, it's all a spiral, spiral. or a ringu or an uzumaki or a, oh. a rosin, depending on the angle of the spiral. Japan is a weird language. Japanese is a weird language. Japan is a weird language. Japan, Japan is a weird language. <laughs> Upcoming on the horror of Babylonia. Babylonia. Upcoming on the horror of Babylon next Sunday, we will be doing a compare and contrast on Stanley Kubrick's 1962 ver version of Lolita versus the 1997 adaptation starring Jeremy Irons. I might watch them tonight. Make some notes. And the next Sunday, <laughs> first, <laughs> July 2nd, we will be reviewing Usamu Tezuka's M.W. or moi debate still ongoing. Hopefully we'll have a definitive answer by the episode. And the next Sunday we are finally getting to Salem's Lot by Stephen King. And our next three bonus episodes on Thursdays we, we, we used to be like oh sometimes we do bonus episodes on Thursdays but we're basically just a bi-weekly podcast now. We're like twice a week. I can't remember the last time we didn't release an episode on a Thursday and a Sunday. What have we done? Uh, we accepted money. <laughs> <laughs> so this Thursday... I think if we got any other patrons, we'd have to be like, okay, this week you get a bonus episode. We, yeah. We'd have to like find a way to space it. I, no more patrons, please. I would like dollar and five dollar tiers because they're easy. This coming Thursday, we are reviewing Treehouse of Horror, Married to the Blob, which will wrap up the Blobathon. The following Sunday, Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming is paying us to review The Toxic Avenger. Thursday, July the 6th, we are reviewing, by reviewing I mean we're doing a live reaction to Yoko Ono and John Lennon's Fly, which I'm sure... I'm we, actually excited to do it as a live reaction. I, I am... We should have, I, I watched about two minutes of it. We should have beer on hand. Oh, God, yes. I'm going to be upset. I'm just us, telling you that ahead of time. I'll bring us Fireball. <laughs> and then the, the following Fuck. Thursday will be our next Treehouse nope. of Horror of Babylon episode where we review The Simpsons' Dial Z for Zombies, which is their zombie mishmash, a um, match, mashup, mix up episode, which partially involves Pet Cemetery. In the pet cemetery. All right. Um, thank you both, especially you have, for uh, reading Lolita. I in think I two should be thanking weeks. you guys for indulging me. I said my opinion. 
and I wasn't ignorant, and I didn't bash anybody, and I, I didn't purposely try to trigger you. So good job, Ryan. And I didn't get mad. <laughs> and you didn't get mad. I think we had a good time. And Hef attended. Hef, Hef was here. I want to give him. I'm going to start bringing participation ribbons. <laughs> you read Lolita. <laughs> oh, I'll get custom ones for me too. So. Achievement unlocked. Gonna, Fire of my loins. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it right there next to my little doki doki girl hanging on the noose. Oh, oh God! They're supposed to be announcing the uh, Nindroid for. Uh, Sayori soon, and I'm like, come with a rope, come with a rope. <laughs> that poor little girl. Have Christmas present. <laughs> I wish I could. If you just... spend, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be more mad that you spend that much money on me at then Christmas I, than yeah. the actual like gift itself. I'm just yeah. gonna tell you that now. No, I, I yeah, I agree there. <laughs> Thank you to our patrons, Abigail the First, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons, and Logan. Logan. The, the full, full metal, metal patron. patron. And Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming, which you can visit at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia, or the Mall of Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And say hello to Ronald Ronald, Humbert of Christmas. <laughs> Thank you both rabble, for... Rabble, <laughs> rabble. <laughs> rabble, rabble, rabble. I don't know about you guys, but... Uh, like, a, like a good piece of wasabi after a hot piece of sushi, I need a palate cleanser. Yeah. So uh, thank you for reading Lolita and recording tonight with me, guys. Stay tuned for our socials and stay scary. Stay scary, everybody. Stay scary, folks. I kind of want wasabi peas. Go for it, you animal. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher, and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that the Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, and all other major podcast apps. Stay scary. The the impression... Stop turning on the printer! <laughs> <laughs> he wants to tell us his opinion on a, Lolita. It's a CAT scan. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>